Please join me in welcoming Scott Rowan. Thank you very much, Jim. Wow, thank you for everybody showing up. Wow, great crowd. Uh, I, I have to say, uh, I'm going to ask you guys to do a favor for me, if you don't mind. Uh, I've done more than 50 interviews across the country, and I'm always one-on-one -on -one with uh, different in, in interviewers. It's just a one-on-one -on -one type thing, and being in front of a large crowd is a different experience. So if you don't mind, uh, if you could indulge me for a split moment, could everybody say cheese for me? I want to take a selfie with everybody. One, two, three, cheese. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, well, you probably have heard that uh, we didn't really land on the moon. And it's true, Neil Armstrong didn't. It was really Ron Santo, in case you didn't uh, know that ahead of time. Let me give you a little bit about background and, and why we're here. I think that that'll help uh, set the stage for what we're about to go through. Uh, first, uh, what I'll do is I'll just touch on a number of stories, and um, then we'll open it up to a Q&A for a couple of minutes. And then afterwards, like you say, we'll do a signing out there because I'm sure everyone wants to take care of their holiday gifts buying right now. It's a great time to buy five or six books. I've lived in Chicago since 1999. Uh, I'm a former newspaper reporter, and uh, most recently with the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, and the number one rule in journalism that we learn is never assume anything. Our goal is to uncover the truths, uh, sometimes truths that uh, people assume are fact, but then we find are actually more myth than they were fact. Uh, that is the goal. Uh, after my career in journalism, I went to what we call the dark side, uh, where I began working in uh, corporate communications. <clears throat> and in that realm, I spent 15 years doing that, working in nine languages around the globe. And the specialty that I had was uh, manufacturing news. Um, manufacturing news is pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, Stephen Colbert has a term called truthiness. It, it sounds like the truth, but it's really not the truth. Manufacturing news is the exact same thing uh, for products, people, events. Uh, my specialty was inventing what really sounded like news, but really wasn't. I was pretty good at it. I was able to work, at, work with hundreds, if not thousands, of media outlets across the country. Everyone from Oprah Winfrey, David Letterman, all the way down to weekly newspapers and just about every single state. I don't think I'll claim Alaska and Hawaii, but continental. Um, on a personal side, my family for generations have been in military intelligence. So on the private side of things, away from the public eye, I know for a fact that there are so many things that happen that none of us know anything about. Uh, a number of stories that are shared that you can't share with the public. Uh, and it goes from both my mother and father's side, quite frankly, all the way back to the start of the country. Uh, this is uh, George Clinton. He was my great-great-grandfather. He was uh, Vice President of the United States, actually twice, uh, under uh, TJ, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, James Madison. And... Uh, as a founding father, that's why the Clinton stop here in Chicago is named for Grandpa, Grandpa Clinton. <laughs> Not George Clinton from uh, Parliament P-Funk. That would be pretty cool, actually, but uh, no, more of the uh, boring white guy, not the cool black guy. Uh, and some of the things that I even have family still working on stuff that's up till today in military intelligence, things that really, you really weren't sure if they were real about these things. But uh, I knew about Patriot missile defense systems, looked at the blueprints and everything five to ten years before the 1991 Persian Gulf Wars. And still up until last year, have a number of people working, uh, trying to take down Boko Haram. So uh, sometimes there's good, sometimes there's bad. Uh, frankly, uh, I had no interest in going into the military. I really wanted to try and... Uh, uh, I became fascinated with people who wanted to change the world. People who were uh, individuals who sought to do things or with their companies or with their creations uh, to change the world. So between... The, the journalism background and the military background. That's why the very beginning of this book, the very first four words are question everything, assume nothing. And that's the basis with which we're going to start tonight. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> the, 
One of the things I learned quickly in my research was when we talk about change in the world, what is it that we really mean? We're really talking about civilization. But one of the quick things that I learned when we start trying to define civilization is, what is civilization? Uh, Again, (laughs) something like a naive idiot, I thought this was a pretty simple question to answer. There really wasn't one coherent answer. I went through dozens of books, couldn't find any one coherent answer that was the same from, from source to source to source. So what I... Had, because I felt that I had to create a, a, a basis for which we were going to compare different teams, organizations. And so I came up with four things that seemed to sum up. There was four things and a fifth that sort of orbits around it. First, we have law and order. And this is probably the biggest um, and in many cases the most interesting. It involves everything from the military and police, but it also involves vices and crimes, social order, race relations. Uh, We have commerce, that is pretty obvious, everything to do with business. Uh, We have religion, spiritual observances, and and even if you're not a religious person, it's impossible to ignore the fact that it says in God we trust on our money, so you're carrying a little bit of a round in your pocket right now. And then, of course, last, entertainment. Um, Entertainment having two categories. There's oratorical, like this presentation right now. And, of course, there's performances slash athletic, which is 100% where baseball, the Cubs, and everybody else falls in. The one thing that I noticed is that education doesn't have to be part of this. That's the fifth part that sort of orbits around this. Going all the way back to the Assyrians, to the Egyptians, nine, ten thousand 10,000 years BC, they had all four of these, but they didn't have formal education. So how can you say, would you say that they weren't civilized? Absolutely not. They were an incredibly civilized society. And if you look at it today, in regions where the Taliban are trying to take control, education is one of their enemies. They don't want education. So education is not necessarily one of these four tenets, though it is the one thing that revolves around it. So uh, let's let's look at the very first one, commerce. The world's first professional league. You know, the very basic question is, why the Chicago Cubs? Why not some of the other teams? Uh, Well, some people would say, why not the Yankees? Why not the Red Sox? Why not the White Sox? And the answer is, is very simple. None of those teams even existed before 1901. By 1901, the Chicago Cubs already had professional baseball's first dynasty begin, reach its zenith, and come to an end, before these guys were even in existence. Um, everything is hinged on this guy, William Holbert. If you're a Cubs fan, you'll know that this was the guy who gave birth to professional sports around the world. He was a big businessman here in town, uh, a coal merchant who was so successful he was able to branch out into a number of other fields. Uh, He was very successful. Uh, I think that Chicagoans may know him from one of his best quotes, I'd rather be a lamppost in Chicago than a millionaire in any other city. He's a very proud Chicagoan. And it was his idea to come up with professionalism. Uh, Prior to William Holbert, all leagues were all amateur or semi-pro at best. Baseball historians will tell you how, uh, well, there was the professional players and professional teams. Yes, but there wasn't a professional league. Uh, at best, they were able to stitch together a few uh, games against other pros. But it was semi-pro at best before William Holbert. Uh, William Holbert, in 1876, gave birth to his idea. He felt that the players, um, we have, uh, this is St. Louis Browns at the bottom, they'll cut off. The players just were, were too loosey-goosey. They needed to be pros. So he wanted a businessman. As a businessman, he felt that business needed to step in for the better of the sport. So you could say on the one side that uh, bringing big business into the game may not be the best thing, but he really brought a cohesion that all other subsequent leagues have copied. Now you'll notice here that of the teams, uh, the, the Boston Red Stockings, who eventually become uh, the Braves, the Atlanta Braves, uh, between the Cubs and the Braves, oh, and by the way, I'm going to just refer to the Cubs as the Cubs throughout. Uh, technically speaking, they're the White Stockings for so many years, Orphans, Colts, then Cubs. I'm just for ease to make it easy for everybody, we're just going to refer to them as the Cubs the whole time. But there's only two teams that exist still today that date back to 1876. Of course, the Cubs, that's why we're talking about them, and the Braves. But the Braves, not only they went from Boston, then they went to Milwaukee, then they went to Atlanta. Uh, Other teams came along, teams that 
uh, began that have their origins that, that exist today and had their origins back, origins back years ago. You can see as the Cardinals and the Pirates and the Reds, followed by the Giants and the Phillies and the Dodgers. But it was only the Braves, it was only the Cubs that were the two in the very beginning. And, and quite frankly, uh, the ideas that Holbert instilled have been copied by every other professional league around the planet. It all began in 1876. They won the inaugural championship. And they had the dynasty. Here's what we're looking at. The first 11 seasons, uh, they had six championships in the first 11 seasons. This is the dynasty that we'll refer to a couple of times, the 1880s dynasty. And so without William Holbert, uh, who's buried just up on the north side, and, and in uh, the Cubs quotient, we have a geoverse that'll help you find where he's still located today. Uh, he stands out pretty much in the cemetery as a, the most unusual gravestone in it. Next, we'll talk about law and order, and this is one that most people get caught up on. I know I, I certainly did. I grew up thinking Jackie Robinson was the first black baseball player. I just knew that. That was a fact. That's what I thought. Um, that's what I had read everywhere. And it's just simply not true. Not even was, was he not the first, he wasn't even the second. Everybody knows Jackie Robinson, right? Number 42. Everybody knows him, first black player. Uh, debuted April 15th, 1947. Uh, 1949, named the MVP. And then when he retired, 1962, he became one of the very few first ballot Hall of Famers. Everybody knows this. He's the first black player in Major League history. That's why. Uh, 1997, Bud Sillig started Jackie Robinson Day uh, to celebrate uh, breaking the color barrier. Uh, and of course he should. He was the first black player. But it's just not true. Is Jackie Robinson Day a fraud? Now listen, I'm not trying to insult anything Jackie Robinson did. That'd be insane. Uh, but what I am saying is that there was much more to the story uh, than, than what usually gets reported. And I know that when I discovered that Jackie Robinson was not the first African American, I asked other people, I said, did you guys hear this? Did you know this? I said, no, you're nuts. You're crazy. You'll notice in everything that Major League Baseball says, the phrase they use is, he broke the color barrier. The Dodgers themselves, they switch it up a little bit. They say the color line. Same, same. Even in his Hall of Flame plaque, you'll see here, uh, integrated uh, the modern Major Leagues in the face of intense adversity. Jeez, Louise, it really seems like you're going out of your way to, to try and hide some of the truth here. What, what, what are you trying to get at? Uh, it does lead to some obvious questions. Why was there this color barrier? Who established it and when? And unfortunately for Cubs fans, we'll go ahead and, and just sort of get this story out of the way, sort of like ripping a Band-Aid off of a hairy, you know, if you're a hairy guy like myself, it's not feeling good. The reason is because of the Chicago Cubs. It all began going back to 1876, the very first season. This is A.G. Spaulding. And the reason that the Cubs were so good was because this guy was the star player. A.G. Spaulding, you probably recognize his name from Spaulding Brothers, the manufacturing company. This is him. He was the founder of it. And he was eager to leap from Boston to Chicago because he knew he was starting a manufacturing company. And Chicago was as good as New York or Boston to start a sporting goods company. Uh, in fact, he immediately secured the right to manufacture all balls for the National League, and Spalding Brothers held that contract for a full century. It wasn't until 1977 that uh, they lost the contract to Rawlings. Um, they had it for both the American League and the National League. And he, was, uh, he changed sports, not just in baseball, but these guys were the very first manufacturers of footballs, basketballs, all the equipment. All of the books, the rule books, the publications, the magazines, it was as big an empire as you can imagine. Now, in 1882, William Holbert dies, and at that point, A.G. Spaulding takes over as the Cubs owner. And at that point, a number of things begin to change. Uh, 1882 was a pretty big year because A.G. Spaulding was turning around and taking over the Cubs, but little did he know he was getting ready to have a conflict uh, on, the, on the horizon. You can see here, uh, the effect that A.G. Spaulding has had on the game is as large as anyone. You could call him the Steve Jobs, you could call him the Bill Gates, the George Washington, uh, his innovations. He, he influenced not just commerce and entertainment, but social relations and race relations, um, all because of a young man who was getting ready to make his debut. Uh, Cap Anson worked together with Spaulding, and unfortunately, they were going to have their run ins with this guy here. This is Moses Fleetwood Walker, and it's, uh, 
cut off at the bottom here, but this is 1882 with the University of Michigan Wolverines. And uh, the young black man circled there is Moses Walker. And he was the first uh, black baseball player uh, with the University of Michigan. And he was so good that the Toledo Blue Stockings identified this guy as the guy that they had to have uh, for their team to be a success. Uh, they knew that going into the 1883 season, everything was on the table. 1883 was a year that all the minor leagues pushed their chips into the center of the table. Uh, it was the, a do or die season in 1883 for one basic reason. One of the teams in the Northwestern League was going to advance to become a major league team. Uh, at this time, the National League was the only major leagues in the country, and there were two other leagues that really wanted to be on the same par with them. There was the Northwestern League, which Toledo was a part of, and then there was the American Association. And the American Association was going to become a major league, and they were going to swallow up the number one championship team from the Northwestern. Uh, from the Northwestern League after the 1883 season. So if you were the champion in 1883, you became a major leaguer the following season. Here's a better picture of Moses. I uh, honestly think that he's, he was a smaller guy. He played catcher. It was probably the worst position that you could play for being the first black player. Uh, equipment was horrible. Equipment was rotten. Broken fingers happened all the time. Um, and Unfortunately, Moses had several conflicts with the Cubs, and the upshot of that was the erection of the color barrier. Uh, we're going to look here at the very first one. In 1883, the very pivotal season, the Cubs were coming off of being champions. Uh, Cap Anson was the number one player in all the land. Um, he ended up playing for 27 seasons, and he was completely ingrained in baseball. He was the number one player on the number one team. They were the big dogs in the yard. And barnstorming was how you paid for uh, the team. And so the Cubs were barnstorming across the country, and they were stopping in Toledo. And uh, they were playing a game, and everything changed. When they looked out on the field, and they saw warming up a black guy. That changed everything. And Cap Anson went over, uh, talked to Charlie Morton. This is Charlie Morton, he was the manager of the Toledo team. And what Camp Anson didn't know was Walker was already hurt. Like I say, breaking fingers was common. Walker had a broken hand. He couldn't play. He wasn't planning on playing. Unfortunately, Camp Anson forced the issue. He walks over and he got in Charlie Morton's face. And uh, I want everyone to know I'm quoting here when he says, we ain't playing with no damn nigger. Charlie Morton said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He wasn't even planning to play, but he never got that out of his mouth. Instead, he said, look, you guys can cancel the game if you want, but you're not going to get your half of the gate receipts. Do what you want, but you're going to lose your half. Charlie Morton, to his credit, he goes into the dugout, and he said to uh, Walker, get your glove. You're going to go play in right field. You know, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't care. that you, We're, we're going to put you in the safest spot, but we're going to make sure that you play on the field. And uh, so that was the very first time that the Cubs and uh, Moses Walker had a conflict. Um, it, it is worth noting, Walker didn't do anything in the game. Of course, he had a broken hand. I, I think it's pretty explainable. Uh, he went hitless. He drew a walk, scored a run, but he made no errors. Um, and uh, Chicago won 7-6, to six, but it took 10 innings. It goes to show you, Toledo was a pretty good team, and um, sure enough, they won the championship that year. So that means that for the 1884 season, they were a major league team. They were on par now with Cap Anson and the rest of the Cubs. So May 1, 1884, this is the date that I think that we really should be observing just as much as April 15th. This is the day that the starting catcher for the Toledo Blue Stockings was a young black man named Moses Fleetwood Walker. And even though they lost 5-1 to to Louisville, this was the day of the very first uh, African-American playing in the major leagues. Now, later that season, Toledo was scheduled to play here in Chicago. But unfortunately, uh, that game never happened, uh, simply because before the game, they knew all about Moses Walker, so they sent uh, this demand that came from the, the White Stockings, the Cubs. And I'll go ahead and read it in case it's hard for you to read. Uh, no colored man shall play in your nine, and if your officers insist on playing him, after we are there, you forfeit the guarantee and we refuse to play. Now, I think this is fair as we refuse point blank to play colored men. 
to his eternal credit, Charlie Morton said, get bent, get lost. We're not coming to Chicago. You can keep your money. We're not, we're not even coming to play. It is worth noting that we're talking, this is all happening within 20 years of the Civil War. Uh, there were still survivors of the Civil War at this time. Um, and, and like I say, being a catcher was even worse for Walker. Uh, Jackie Robinson experienced a number of, of difficulties with players, both on his team and other teams, but he didn't really experience what, uh, what Walker went through. Tony Mullaney was his pitcher, and he was as much a racist as Cap Anson was. Um, and so much so that when Moses Walker would call for a curveball, he'd throw a fastball. When he called for a fastball, he'd throw a curveball. And if you've ever, you know, played catcher, you know that you put your hands in different positions to catch the ball. So if you're expecting a curve and you get a fastball, it's easy to break a pinky, it's easy to break a thumb. And that's exactly what happened. He wasn't able to finish the season because his hand was just so broken. Uh, Charlie Morton knew exactly what to do. He had a roster spot to fill. So he turned around and said, I know who I'm going to fill it with. He filled it with Welday Walker. This is the younger brother of Moses Walker. So Welday Walker was the second African-American, and they were the first two siblings, two African-American siblings, to play Major League Baseball. And, and so this is another one that I think would be worth noting. Uh, but they're nothing but a forgotten footnote in history. This is the day that everything changed. When they talk about the color line being drawn, this is the unfortunate date that it happened. By this date, uh, Moses Walker was in New Jersey. He was playing for the Newark Little Giants of the International League. He was the best catcher in the league, very intellectual, very smart. He'd go on to have a successful publishing career. God love those writers and publishers. And uh, um, the thing that was unusual was that they were part of the first black battery. A battery, of course, is a, kitcher, a, petcher, a pitcher and a catcher. Uh, the pitcher was George Stovey. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have a picture of George because I came across a dozen of them online, and each picture was of a different guy. So it was clear to me nobody knew what George Stovey really looked like. Um, but they were the first, uh, uh, first all-black battery in professional baseball, and um, their manager was a guy named Charlie Hackett. Now, when Cap Anson got to Newark, they were again on a barnstorming tour. He saw George Stovey, he saw Moses Walker, and of course, he went over to Hackett, and that's when he said, uh, very simply, take him out or I get off. Well. Unfortunately, Charlie Hackett didn't have the backbone that Charlie Morton did, so he gave in. Neither Stovey nor Walker played in that game. Newark won 9-4. to They actually kicked the Cubs' butt that day. Um, but the real action happened later that night. Uh, later that night, uh, just minutes, if not hours, after the game, they had a secret meeting uh, of all the International League officials. And uh, Charlie Hackett wasn't there. This is Charlie Hackett again. And this is what happened. We have it in black and white from the Newark Daily Journal. And in case you can't read it, I'll read it out loud to you. But this is, makes it clear exactly what happened and when. The International League directors held a secret meeting at the Genesee House yesterday. And the question of colored players was freely discussed. Several representatives declared that many of the best players in the league are anxious to leave on account of the colored element, and the board finally directed Secretary White to approve of no more contracts to colored men. There it is in black and white. Um, over the years, um, Commissioner, Mountain, uh, Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis would try and claim that there was never any, any blackballing, there was never any rules, but here it is, thanks to the New York Daily Journal. Uh, because of the game that they had the day before, they were sick of dealing with the topic, they didn't want to deal with it anymore, it was just easier to go ahead and exclude black players instead of embrace them and come up with a better answer, frankly. Uh, I will note, you'll note at the end of the 1887 season, both George Stovey and Moses Walker were released from the Newark Little Giants. That takes us to the very last conflict, and this one is the saddest of them all. Don't have the exact date, it was in September of 1888. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, Hackett, the manager, and in the back row you'll see uh, Moses Walker. They ended up with the Syracuse Stars, and Cap Anson and the Cubs came to town once again. And of course, Walker had already been through this many times. Hackett himself had already been through it once. Walker didn't even try to get out of the dugout. He just gave up. He said, screw it. I'm not, I'm not going to even try and take him on anymore. 
Now, even though they refused, it was a little confusing. Don't have a good explanation other than why, uh, why they allowed Walker. They had just said that they were going to no, uh, no longer allow um, young black men in the league. But I think that they allowed his contract to stay because they grandfathered him in. It's really been hard to pinpoint why they let him play, but I'm <laughs> very glad that they did. He continued to play until 1891. So we played for a couple more years. Unfortunately, the end of his career was very violent. Uh, he was attacked by a lynch mob. Uh, in New York, and the only way he escaped with his life was that he had to kill a guy. He ended up uh, having to kill Patrick Murray uh, just to save his own life. A few weeks afterwards, uh, a jury and a judge found Walker not guilty of all crimes. It didn't matter. At that point, uh, there was already poison in the well, and in uh, 1908, after his career was over, uh, he became a publisher and a writer. This is the book that he wrote, Our, Colon Our Home Colony. And in it, he expresses his opinions. And I can't blame the guy one bit, but he was more Malcolm X than he was MLK. Uh, his book completely advocates for the segregation of races based on everything that he experienced. So everything he experienced in all of this was really due in many part with his four different run-ins with the Cubs. And the Cubs were not alone in their attitudes, make no mistake. But uh, they were so powerful, they were the number one team, they dominated entertainment and commerce, that they directly affected other people's commentary. Uh, to this day, he is, as I say, other than the occasional bobblehead night, nobody even knows who Moses Walker is. And so that was really the intent here, was to try and share with people, look, not only is Jackie Robinson not the first, he wasn't even the second, and people didn't even know who really was the first. Saul White was a former Negro League player, a Hall of Famer, both as a player and a manager. In 1907, he wrote a book called The History of Colored Baseball, and he really sums it up best. Uh, it's a little cut off there, so let me go ahead and read it to you, because he sums this up uh, in how Cap Anson was able to change other people's opinions. Uh, now, of course, everyone was really unfortunately sharing this opinion, but Cap Anson really uh, basically threw gas on the fire. Just why Adrian C. Anson, manager and captain of the Chicago National League Club, was so strongly opposed to colored players on white teams cannot be explained. His repugnant feeling shown at every opportunity toward colored ball players was a source of comment throughout every league in the country, and his opposition with his great popularity and power in baseball circles hastened the exclusion of the black man from the white leagues. Cubs weren't alone in erecting the color barrier, but if they weren't the architect, if they weren't the engineer, they, they were the foreman in trying to erect this color barrier. And with that, that's why I turn around and I say, knowing what we know, is Jackie Robinson Day a fraud? Jackie Robinson went through great problems and great issues, but he didn't have to kill a man just to stay alive. He didn't have his pitcher breaking his hand so bad that he couldn't finish the season. And I truly think that Moses Walker deserves a little bit more recognition. Now, now that I've filled everybody sufficiently with white guilt, we're going to go ahead and jump on to a little bit more of an entertaining topic. We're going to switch gears and we'll talk about entertainment now. At the same time that Moses Walker was going through things uh, in opposition with the Cubs, the Cubs had a young guy that came along that, quite frankly, uh, anybody would want to have a beer with. This is the one guy in Cubs history, if not baseball history, you'd want to have a beer with. This is Mike King Kelly, and he changed entertainment permanently. Um, he uh, was a Hall of Famer, and he's the Babe Ruth in the 19th century. This is a nickname that he got because he could do it all. He could play catcher, he could play infield, he could play outfield. Uh, and when I say do it all, he was a really good-looking guy. He was a super hard partier. I think of Charlie Sheen a little bit when I think of him. You know, he's, he was the kind of guy that women wanted to be with, and thus guys wanted to be. Uh, um, he uh, played 16 years, and he played in Cincinnati, Chicago, Boston, and New York. And quite frankly, he was the very first true crossover athlete star. Uh, not only uh, was he a star player on the field, a Hall of Famer as a baseball player, he was a vaudeville actor uh, in the offseason. So just like uh, the wonderful luminary great actors, uh, Michael Jordan and Shaquille O'Neal, uh, a, a full century before them, uh, before they were making movies, King Kelly was a vaudeville actor performing and singing and dancing. Uh, he was also credited with having the very first autobiography of a pro player, and he even is credited, believe it or not, with the hobby of autograph collecting. Uh, because he was so popular, everyone had to have his autograph. Um, 
He was the most popular player going back to the 1880s dynasty they're referring to. You can see Cat Vans in there in the dead center. And here's King Kelly. Um, his number one trait was the hook slide. He was a runner. He, he, he always would bend the rules, but his patented move was the hook slide. It's still used somewhat today, but not as much. Um, but when it came to bending the rules, he was a wonderful teammate and a horrible opponent. Uh, if he saw an umpire wasn't paying attention, he would break the rules without a question. He was known from running to, from first base to third base, completely skipping second base if nobody was paying attention. Uh, another time uh, when there was a pop fly uh, and he saw that the outfielder wasn't paying attention, he screamed, uh, Scott out, King Kelly in, ran out and caught the ball. And the umpires had no idea what to do. There really wasn't a rule about such a stupid thing happening, but because it wasn't a rule, they had to let the play stand. His biggest thing was he was a super hard drinker. He was constantly drunk, he, but he was the life of the party. Uh, and his drinking directly led to uh, religious changes that we'll talk about in just a second. He spent seven seasons in Chicago, and as you can see here, the seven seasons that he was here, he was the anchor to their championship teams. During their seven seasons, five championships and one second place. Uh, there was only one problem with his tenure here in Chicago. Halfway through it, as you can see from the dates, William Holbert died. That meant that A.G. Spalding took over. Spalding was a teetotaler, and as a teetotaler, he hated King Kelly. He hated him with the passion. He wanted him to, he, he put up with him because he was a great player, but he wanted nothing to do with him at all. Uh, so on Valentine's Day, 1887, uh, he sent him back, and he traded him to Boston for $10,000, which was an exorbitant amount at the time, a record-setting total. And <laughs> as a proud Irishman myself, I sort of joke that uh, he sent a hard-drinking Irishman from Chicago to Boston, which meant that all he did was just help his career <laughs> become even more popular. Um, when he got there, when he got to Boston, there was a, a vaudeville actor uh, named John W. Kelly. No relation, uh, same last name, just a very popular Irish last name. Now in 1889, after a couple years in, in Boston, John Kelly here, uh, he wrote a song for another Irish woman. Uh, this is Maggie Klein, she's known as the Irish Queen. He wrote this song, and it was called Slide, Kelly, Slide. Uh, I, again, I've looked, and I don't have a good answer. You'll notice that he spelled Kelly wrong. It's just one L. I seriously have a hard time believing that he did it for copyright reasons or some kind of lawsuit. I think he just didn't know how to spell the name. But it does make me giggle because what you basically had was uh, an Irish songwriter writing a song for an Irish performer about an Irish ball player. And together it ended up setting history because two years after the song was created, this guy, George Gaskin, took that song and he recorded it on what was a brand new invention at the time, the wax cylinder. Um, the phonograph had just been invented a few years earlier by, by Thomas Edison, and the wax cylinder was a, a, a way for people to listen to their own recording, with, to individual recordings at home. And the only categories that they sold in the first couple of years were four categories. It was either an opera or classical, religious or patriotic. But when George Gaskin released Slide, Kelly, Slide, this wasn't any one of those. So. On January 9th, 1892, a strange thing happened in the music industry. The number one selling song in all the land was Slide Kelly Slide, which makes that song the very first pop tune. Now, it's just a stupid song. It's a silly song. It's a song about baseball. It doesn't have anything to do with, again, those four mm, somewhat boring categories of opera, classical, religious, or patriotic. And we'll go ahead and listen to... Is it... To Australia, slide, Kelly, slide. Sorry, I thought it was going to come out over the speakers. That part about Australia, uh, that reference is uh, in 1888, Spalding put together the very first world tour that uh, was going to Australia. So that meant that if you were the best guy, you were going to be on the team. But as we said, Spalding hated Kelly. Kelly hated Spalding. So uh, no, Kelly wasn't a part of these guys who were desecrating the Sphinx uh, back in 1888. Uh, the Egyptians were really pissed off. They, they, they really didn't welcome and they told these guys, you can, take, you can take your sport and go home. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, the alcoholism caught up with King Kelly, and he died at uh, age 36. Uh, but his popularity kept going for decades, and Slide Kelly Slide in 1927 led to this movie being made. It led to two different kinds, of, two different versions of the movie being made. But in this one, it has a thing that I think is important. If you notice, one of the uh, co-stars in it is an actor named Harry Carey, and it's spelled C-A-R-E-Y. Very popular actor back in the day. Uh, he was so popular that when a young sports announcer was beginning his career, a guy named Harry Christopher Carabina, he needed to come up with a different name, and so he decided to call himself an homage to that. We know him today as Harry Carey, that's C-A-R-A-Y, and it was based off of uh, that actor. So between um, King Kelly has a direct relation to Mr. Harry Carey. We'll talk about something that most people have. This is one of the, <laughs> the most rock solid stories that we'll find out of all the 77 stories, believe it or not, uh, changing Christian evangelism. Um, now, contemporary Christianity, evangelism specifically, was changed forever by the Cubs. Other religions have, have picked up on these lessons and used it in their own services. And it seems quite fitting that the person who should do this change was a, was a guy named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday played for the Cubs for eight seasons. Uh, excuse me, he played from 1883 to 1887. He had an eight-year career altogether. He left the Cubs after a couple years and ended up playing in Pittsburgh. Uh, he was incredibly fast. He was an outfielder who was lightning fast. He was recorded as being able to go around the bases in 14 seconds. And the record still today is only 14.1 seconds. So even if he was playing today, he would be the fastest guy in the league. Or if not, he would be one of the fastest. Um, and of course, at that time, he was a teammate with King Kelly. And they couldn't have been more opposite. Uh, King Kelly, as we have already said, was a womanizer, a hard partier. Billy Sunday, he was a quiet boy from Iowa. Uh, he'd go out drinking with the guys. He was never really known to get drunk, but he was a good teammate. He'd go out drinking. And quite frankly, the story we're about to tell happened just one block away from here. I mean, literally, if, if the buildings were gone, any one of us could hit it with a baseball because they were drinking on State Street over here over in eight, oh, back in 1886. And they took a break. I'm sure that they were pounding drinks pretty hard. And they ended up right over here uh, where... Uh, what is it, uh, Jones College Prep? It used to be known as uh, the Pacific Garden Mission was there. And so they were taking a break in 1886, sitting there, and all of a sudden, spilling out of the Garden Mission, they could start to hear some uh, Christian hymns being sung. One in particular really got to Billy Sunday. It was, Where is my boy tonight? And he sat there and he started crying. He started thinking of his mama back in Iowa, who sang that song to him when they were younger. And immediately it changed him. He, he stopped drinking that night, turned and recommitted himself to Christianity, and, uh, but he, he was nervous because he was still a baseball player. He was still an entertainer. He still had to be one of the guys. And uh, so he went and he talked to King Kelly, and he sort of bared his soul and said, look, I, this is what I'm going to do. And, and let's be honest, he just didn't want to take a lot of ribbing from the players. He wanted to see how it was gonna, what the reaction was going to be. To his credit, King Kelly said, Hey, do what you're going to do. That's fantastic. It's for you. It's not for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to stop. But you go right ahead and you do that. And they ended up being really great teammates uh, until the end of uh, their respective careers. In the 1890s, Billy Sunday, as soon as his career was over, began preaching uh, for the YMCA. And what he was known for was being incredibly flamboyant. He would run across the stage, he would leap up and down, and, and you can see he started imitating baseball pitching and catching, and he was always known for breaking a chair a minimum of once. He would smash the chair, and he became a huge performer. He turned it from something that was just a boring uh, sermon at a pulpit, and he made it a performance. Uh, he was the entertainer at heart, and he was taking the lessons that he had learned from the Cubs, where they, they made it more than just a game, they made it a spectacle, they made it something to uh, that you had to attend. And uh, that was exactly the exuberance that he brought to it. And part of his genius was, you know there's that old saying that uh, if Moses isn't going to go to the mountain, you bring the mountain to Moses. So that's what he did. Um, he took his preaching across the country into communities that, that didn't have any churches. They just weren't able to, to, to have the services the way they wanted it. Um, so he would take his revivals and his evangelism and, and go from town to town to town. But he was scared 
and they had a, a tent below down in Colorado, and he was afraid that somebody was going to get hurt. So he said, no more tents, we're going to go full bore. And they ended up building massive tabernacles. These things would seat up to 10,000 people. And he would have his employees, uh, basically disciples, go out six weeks, eight weeks ahead of time. And they would build these massive tabernacles. To give you a good idea, uh, Allstate Arena here in town seats about 20,000 people. These guys were building something that was half that size in a matter of two to three weeks. Uh, And they lasted afterwards. These were incredibly well-built and well-thought-out structures. what Billy Sunday insisted was they'd even have their own P.O. box built into them so that as soon as, as soon as you found God, you could turn around and write a letter back home and get everyone converted. You could spread the word about Billy Sunday. Uh, he had uh, nurseries built into the tabernacles because as much as a showman as he was, he didn't want anyone upstaging him. He didn't care if they were a baby or not. So he'd say, I'm, I'm so glad you brought your baby. That's wonderful. Go, go put him over there. We've got babysitters. <laughs> Keep the loud noise out of here. He also covered the floors in sawdust. He didn't want any of the noise to take away from his presentations, which is why they were called the sawdust trails. And um, the the organization that he put into this still is staggering today. I just couldn't imagine it being done today. They were able to collect, uh, when they had to send the collection plate around, collecting tithes, it took them just three minutes to take a collection from more than 8,000 people. While, he, while the men were building the tabernacles, six weeks ahead of time of his arrival, the wives would start leading prayer groups. And just like today, when we know that a team is coming to town or the Cubs is going someplace special, you, you circle a special date and you say, oh, I can't wait to go to this concert, I can't wait to, to see this team. He knew that that was what he needed to do with his parishioners. And so he was really building up this, this feeling of, oh, I can't wait to see this guy. So the, the wives of the guys building the tabernacles, they whipped everyone up into a frenzy. And so and give you, I'll give you an idea of some of the numbers. Scranton, Pennsylvania. These are numbers from Scranton. Um, my dad's family's from there originally. So I know it's, it's not that small, a pl- not that big a place, pretty small place. And in just three weeks in Scranton, Pennsylvania, they were able to put together more than 4,000 prayer meetings. 4,137, according to Billy Sunday's biography. Attended by more than 63,000 people in just a three-week period. By the time Billy Sunday passed away in, 19, in 1935, he had preached before 85 million people, which is more than anyone on the planet. He was the most popular preacher. He was also by far the richest. He would take his payment with simply whatever the collection was on the last day of his revival in that town. And in some towns, it exceeded $100,000. This was back in 1920. I think $100,000 is a pretty good paycheck still today for a week's work. But back in 1920, it put him as one of the richest men in the country. One of the things that he did different... In addition to making everything entertaining and and trying to jump around and get everyone excited, he knew that he had to bring music to it. He wanted to make this a destination. So he had a 12 and 15 piece band so that they were not just playing simple, boring Christian hymns and dirges that will put you to sleep. He hired this guy, Fred Fisher, uh, to be his band director. And if you're into music, uh, if you're into music history, you probably know that Fred Fisher is in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. He's in that really because of one main song that he wrote. And it launched the career for Frank Sinatra. He's the guy who wrote in 1922 Chicago, that title in town. And he wrote that song because he owed his boss. He was still friends with Billy Sunday. And that's why there was a line in the song that I know when I was a kid growing up, I never understood a couple of the lines in the song. I would just sort of mutter through them, you know. And this was one of the lines that always confused me. The town that Billy Sunday couldn't shut down. Um, why was Billy Sunday trying to shut down Chicago? I mean, that was, that was part of the confusion. And the answer is very simple. It was alcohol. Uh, Billy Sunday had preached abstinence, not moderation, complete abstinence. He saw alcohol as the devil. And he had something that he termed uh, the booze sermon. And it was the hallmark. It was his greatest hits. It was what he did everywhere. And it was a 19-minute speech in the sermon that when it was done, he would make sure that everyone who heard it gave up alcohol for love of God and country. Um, now, his, 
his insistence on abstinence made him very close friends with some very powerful people. Uh, John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. They considered themselves to be very close friends because Rockefeller felt that alcohol made for horrible employees. President Woodrow Wilson was also a very close friend. The three of them were very close. The difference was, of course, that uh, Billy Sunday was an elected official and he wasn't a despised person the way Rockefeller was because he was so rich. But because he reached 85 million people, Billy Sunday is credited with being one of the forces, one of the largest forces uh, behind the 18th Amendment being ratified. You know, it was the Volstead Act. We know it as Prohibition. And on uh, January 16, 1919, Prohibition was passed in large part because of what Billy Sunday did. In addition to changing uh, what was considered entertainment, considered how religion was done, he also changed alcohol. And so that takes us back to the town that Billy Sunday couldn't shut down, that line. Why, why couldn't he shut it down? And the answer, of course, is really in, in two words. Al Capone. We're getting to the very end here. I promise you we're, we're just moments away. We're, now we're going to talk about one of the stories that uh, uh, most people I've found that I've been talking to really enjoy hearing the most. Um, Al Capone. 1925, Johnny Torrio survived an assassination attempt. He was the head of the outfit, and that was what the, uh, the mob was called here in Chicago. He uh, survived an assassination attempt in 1925 and said, that's it, I'm done, I quit, I retire. And he turned around and he handed over everything to a young guy named Al Capone. Uh, now, Al Capone, as most people know, lived on the south side, all the Capones lived on the south side, but he was a big Cubs fan. And he gave a few reasons over the years why he was a Cubs fan. He said, uh, you know, first and foremost, I'm already affiliated so much with the south side, let's go ahead and diversify, a little diversification. Um, he felt that the north side was going to become uh, the most popular part of, of Chicago in the long run. And, uh, and, at the, and, and at the very least, Gabby Hartnett was his favorite player. Gabby Hartnett, of course, uh, played for the Cubs. F equals B, B equals C. That makes him, his brother Ralph, and the rest of the family all Cubs fans. Bill Veck is one of the most interesting guys in baseball history. Uh, Bill Veck is uh, the source for some of the stories that we have here. And I'll tell you ahead of time that all of the stories that we'll talk about Al Capone over the next three or four minutes were brought together from different areas. And I actually sat down and I interviewed and talked with some of the surviving Capone family members to verify and learn a few things. And, and they verified a few things that I find interesting. We won't really go into tonight, but uh, um, uh, I'll whet your appetite. Uh, uh, John Dillinger and, and Capone actually were interrelated and they did confirm that, but, but that's a story for another day. Bill Veck, as we know, is a Hall of Famer as an executive. Uh, he, was, he had every position at, at one time in baseball, in large part due to his father, William Veck. When Bill Veck was just four years old, William Veck uh, was named president of the Cubs. William Veck was uh, a former newspaper reporter here in town and was named president and thus Bill Vex says he was the only kid who was raised in a ballpark, that ballpark being Wrigley Field. Um, and in his uh, autobiography, Vex is in Wreck, he openly talks about the fact that he knew that the outfit was there, he knew Capone was there, and he even knew who the conduit was. Um, there was a specific guy that was on the Cubs payroll, a guy named uh, Red Thompson. He worked in ticket sales and Red was the connection between the outfit and the Cubs. Whenever the Capone family or whenever the outfit visited Wrigley Field, they would always go to Red's booth and get their tickets. Now, this connection ended up being very helpful for the Vex and the Cubs in the long run. Because unfortunately, uh, oh, here's Ralph Capone. We know him as Ralph Capone, uh, the uh, uh, older brother of, of Al Capone, but he was public enemy number three. And he was as big or bigger a Cubs fan as Al Capone. And because he didn't have the face and the face recognition that Al Capone had, he was often out in the outfield at Wrigley Field, according to Bill Veck. And it ended up helping him because, unfortunately, in 1933, William Veck was diagnosed with leukemia. And it happened around the middle of the season in 1933, and they knew that by the end of the season he was most likely going to be dead. Unfortunately, prohibition was still in, in place, so when the doctors told Bill Veck, look, the one thing that can really help your father in these last few months, the last few weeks, uh, alcohol could ease the pain. It would just help him get through uh, to the end. Um, 
prohibition. It was illegal to go get it, but he knew one place to go get it. So Bill Vec went on down to the south side, just a few blocks from here, down to the Hotel Metropole, and he walked in, and according to, to his story, he talked to Al Capone uh, and, and explained the story to him and said, this is what we need. Now, keep in mind, the Capones were huge fans. It was 1933. The Cubs had won the 1929 World Series, the 1932 World Series, in large part because of William Vec. So if you're a Cubs fan and you had access to alcohol, what would you do? Uh, Every day, the next day uh, when he got home in that morning, there was a case of champagne on the Vex doorstop. And every day for the rest of his life, which was only a few more weeks, a new case of champagne arrived from the Capones in the outfit there for uh, William Vec. And as Bill Vec says in his book, the last nourishment that passed between my daddy's lips on this earth with Alice Capone's champagne. Now, we do got to take this story with a complete grain of salt for one very big reason. Um, Two years earlier, Al Capone was found guilty of tax evasion. Um, so it was impossible for Bill Vec to have spoken with Al Capone about this. I have no doubt that he dealt with the outfit, no doubt that he dealt with a Capone. Um, it wasn't a L Capone, it was just a Capone. Uh, it's probably Ralph or maybe one of the other brothers. Um, but there's no doubt that he knew about, that Vec knew the influence that the Capones had. Not only was he dealing with them, but a couple of years earlier, Hack Wilson had to use the Capones to uh, help set his record-breaking season in 1930. 1930, he hit, oh, it really, that, that cropped him off pretty bad. Well, I promise you, he's got a forehead. He, he has eyes, he had pretty good eyes. Uh, he's a really, he was one of the shortest players in baseball history. Too bad he wasn't a little bit shorter, we would have gotten him in. Uh, Okay, 1930, he sets the record for 191 RBI. Um, and the only problem was he was becoming very popular at the time, and kidnappings were a, a huge threat. Uh, the Leopold and Lode kidnappings, uh, the Lindbergh baby kidnappings in the upcoming years would become international headlines. And kidnapping was such a real serious threat that uh, the commissioner himself, who used to be a former judge, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, sat his family down and said, when you get kidnapped, this is what you do. Not if you get kidnapped, when you get kidnapped. He was already planning for it, um, just to give you an idea of, you know, unfortunately what things were like at the time. To make matters even worse, one of Hack Wilson's, one of the guys that lived in his apartment building was a guy named Jack Acosta. Unfortunately for Jack's future, uh, he worked with Al Capone, so he got shot dead just a few feet away from Hack Wilson's front door. Um, Hack Wilson was known to drink at the Green Mill quite a bit, and if you know your geography, the Green Mill is just a few blocks away from Wrigley Field. The Green Mill, of course, is popular for being where Capone's outfit would hang out, in large part because Jack Machine Gun McGurn, the guy who's allegedly uh, the, the mastermind, the assassin behind the Valentine's Day Massacre, uh, was rumored to be a part owner of uh, the Green Mill, which is why they still have their uh, pictures of Capone there in the bar, which makes it easy to see how Hack Wilson could become buddies with Capone. And they clearly became buddies because uh, Capone was concerned and worried that not only were they friends, he was seeing his friends get killed just for being friends with Capone, but he also was a huge Cubs fan. Hack was on a record-breaking season in 1930, so Al Capone took his own personal bodyguard, a guy named T-Bone, and he assigned him to the Wilson family. Uh, Hack was worried, and, and with T-Bone's protection, Hack's wife Virginia, Hack's wife son Bobby, and Hack himself never experienced any problems. So due directly because of T-Bone and Capone's influence, uh, 191 RBI happened. But not all the connections were hidden. Few people knew about that one. This, of course, is one of the most infamous photos in baseball history. Uh, and this was taken on 1931, September 9th, 1931 at Comiskey Park. Every year, uh, the White Sox and the Cubs had the, the City Series. Gabby Hartnett, the guy in the picture here, as we said, was Capone's favorite player. So he's signing uh, baseball here for Al Capone. For his son, that's his, his kid, Sonny, next to him. Um, and, and that really is his son. There's a lot of rumor. That was one of the things I checked with the Capones. Uh, that really is his son. There was some people said that he had a stand-in and a double for his kid. And that really seems to piss off the Capone family because you're somehow insulting uh, Italian heritage. Uh, where people get tripped up on is, is that Sonny was technically his stepson. So I think that's where somehow a little is lost in translation. Uh, so he's signing this, this, this picture is infamous for more than one reason. Um, what really kills me is, if you pay attention and look here, we'll see this guy sitting to the right of Sonny. That's Roland Libanati. 
Roland Libanati was one of the most popular politicians in Illinois for 30 years. He was a congressman, he was a senator, and there he is sitting with Capone and his family, leisurely taking in a game in the best seats, and sitting right behind him. See the, uh, uh, one the, the, the fedora guys and, uh, and the fellow there without the hat? I love these names. I just got to share them with you. Those were some of his henchmen. Uh, one is Sam Golfbag Hunt. Uh, the other is Fred Cowboy Frank Pacelli. And then just outside of the picture here is uh, Machine Gun McGurn. And, and I just want to know how he got the nickname Golfbag. How, do how does a mobster get the nickname Golfbag? Um, well, as we said, Gabby. Gabby also, like Hack Wilson, was a drinker, partier, and he knew uh, Al Capone. That's why they were comfortable with each other. And he had a good sense of humor. So after the game, reporters asked Gabby Hartnett, you know, what, public enemy number one, you're kibitzing with public enemy number one, do you think that that's okay? And Gabby replied very simply, look, I go to his place of business, why shouldn't he come to mine? Now. Commissioner Landis went insane. He said, it's bad enough you got your picture taken with him, but now you're admitting to the world, you're going to these illegal bars. What the hell are you thinking? Cut it out, stop completely. Uh, and so he said, no more pictures, no more, no more being seen at all with Capone. And so Gabby had a very simple but funny reply. He said to him, look, okay, but if you don't want me to have my picture taken without Capone, you tell him. <laughs> now, We'll wrap up here with the most amazing thing of all, and uh, I don't know if the audio will pick up, so let me move this out the way. Truth is, one of the most famous lines in movie history, one of the best movies, if you're a gangster fan, ever made, actually has very direct connections with the Capones as well. I don't know if you can hear. I'm going to make him an offer he can refuse. Most famous line from one of the most fam famous gangster movies ever made. By the end of his life, Capone, much like his predecessor, Johnny Torrio, was just sick of the gangster life. He was tired. He actually had uh, one time where he survived an attack where they shot more than a thousand bullets into the little cafe that he was having coffee in. So he was sitting there confiding in Ralph Capone, and he said, yeah, I, I, I got to get out of the business. Got to get out. Got to leave it behind. Ralph said, what are you going to do? He says, you know what? He, he loved men's clothing. He thought he was a, well, a very good dresser. Not, not like me. Not like me at all. He said, I'm going to go into men's fashion. And then they both said, eh, that's a little too foo-foo for a gangster, don't you think? And they said, yeah. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to become an actor, and I'm going to, I'm going to write my own life story, and I'm going to act in uh, the movie as well. But you know what? It was really funny. Every time he made a call to a writer, they were just a little too busy. He couldn't get directors and producers to call him back. Go figure. He was Al Capone. Then he said, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to take over the Cubs. I'm going to buy the Cubs. He actually really felt strongly. He, he said oh, many times, you know, I can run the team better than Wrigley can. And Ralph just laughed at him. He said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious here. And he says, uh, okay, okay, okay. Let's take this in steps then. First, what are you going to do with Commissioner Landis? How are you going to... He's not going to let you in. He's not going to let you buy the team. He goes, no problem. I'm just going to use a beard. I'm going to use the fake guy. I'm going to use someone as a front. His first choice, he said, I'm just going to go to Gabby Hartnett. If Gabby says no, you know what I'm going to do? Jack Dempsey, number one boxer in the land. We're friends. We use Jack Dempsey. And he said, you know what? If the athletes don't do it, no problem. We got a lot of guys in our pocket. We got Al Jolson. We got George Jessel. And we got Harry Richmond. Ralph says, okay, okay. If that works, what's your plan? And he goes, that's not all. I've already made other conversations. He said he already talked to Babe Ruth. As most people know, Babe Ruth, his goal when he was done playing was to be a manager. As everyone knows, he never became a manager. And so he saw this as his chance that he could do that. If he just Simpson comes to Chicago, he'd be able to take his career to the next stage. And most surprisingly of all was Satchel Paige. Satchel Paige was still in the Negro Leagues at the time. He was with the Pittsburgh Crawdads. So Capone had already had negotiations with the Crawdads owner, a guy named Bud Greenlee and already was putting together uh, plans and negotiating on how to buy off Satchel Paige's contract. So amazingly, uh, when we go back to racial history, if it had all come together, if the government just hadn't gotten Capone, um, 
when we talk about the color barrier being broken, it would have been Satchel Paige with the Chicago Cubs, not Jackie Robinson with the Dodgers. So he said, okay, that's fine. But seriously, how are you going to get Wrigley to sell you? There's just no way he's going to sell. There is zero chance. He loves it. Cubs are his baby. He loves baseball. And that's when he says, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Forty years later, Ralph Capone is going to see a new movie called The Godfather in 1972, and he couldn't believe that he heard the exact same line. The line that was used in the movie, talking about a Hollywood producer and a movie production, was actually said earlier about a team owner about the Chicago Cubs. As we all know, unfortunately, the, the uh, tax evasion charges caught up with him, and they completely stopped him. So instead of Al Capone ended up in that, ending up at Wrigley Field, he ended up here in Alcatraz. Most people think also that he died in Alcatraz. Eh, unfortunately, he did not. Uh, he was released in 1939, but by that time, syphilis had rotted his brain to the point that he couldn't remember where he had buried his fortune throughout Chicago. And in 1947, when he died in Florida, they still hadn't found any of the fortune. That pretty much ends the presentation that I have here for tonight. Uh, I appreciate everybody turning out. Thank you for your patience. Um, we're going to have copies back there. Um, and, and I would urge anybody, if you're interested, uh, uh, Sherpa Multimedia, the publisher, we have two other uh, entities online. We have sportshistory.com where we use uh, baseball and sports, not just baseball, but football, basketball, track to teach global history. And if you have anybody who's interested in marine biology, we have uh, the Superfins. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.